we are excited to share out uh, this presentation and this webinar around increasing OER use for online and remote learning within California Community Colleges. And I'll do a, a quick introduction of, of all of our speakers. Um, and, and then I will talk a bit about why uh, we're excited uh, to be a part of this project. So my name is Ryan Erickson Kulas. I'm a program officer at the Michelson 20MM Foundation, primarily uh, focused on open educational resources. Um, also joining me on the panel today, we have Amy Evans Godwin uh, from ISKME. Amy, if you wanna say a quick hello, just so people can associate a name with the face. Thanks, Ryan. This is Amy. Nice to see everyone. Uh, we also have Cynthia Himes from ISKME as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, Jody Steely from Fresno City College. Hello. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, we also have Sally Porter from Fresno City College. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, Wes, Miss, Wes McMichael from Fresno City College. Everyone's going to be from Fresno City College moving forward. <laughs> uh, and then we also are excited to have uh, two student perspectives on the panel. Uh, Giselle Mendoza. And then we also have... Hi, Hi Janelle. And then we also have uh, Nellie Delakian. Everyone. Apologies if I mispronounced that, Nellie. So very quickly, I just want to speak at a high level about the, the Michelson 20MM Foundation and sort of why we were excited to support and partner in this work. Um, our foundation was founded by Dr. Gary K. Michelson in 2010, and we really got our start in the instructional materials space. Dr. Michelson uh, read a story about students at Santa Ana College who could not afford textbooks and uh, faculty were purchasing those textbooks. He established a scholarship at that school, but realized quickly that that didn't really address the root of the problem. And so we uh, really started as a foundation with a $1.5 million grant to open stacks. Uh, since then, we have grown, but really kept the heart uh, of our organization focused on open educational resources. Um, and, and we launched our grant giving vehicle, the Spark Grant Program, in 2019. And the goal of the Spark Grant Program is to really introduce a revolutionary way of grant giving of uh, very quick response, rapid response to needs that are presented within the community. Of course, earlier this year, um, you know, massive change occurred throughout higher education and, and just in life in general with COVID. And so we quickly pivoted and executed a previously unplanned and unbudgeted um, COVID specific Spark Grant round, um, where we uh, responded to proposals within about a three week period um, as to ways in which we could impact the educational sector. And we were really excited to uh, see ISKME's proposal and be able to partner with them as we partnered with them on a, a few different projects. Um, but, but we really saw the value of this moment and making sure that we provided resources to faculty as they were transitioning to teaching remotely and to learn about what areas um, of intersection there could be for them to uh, really start utilizing OER if they haven't previously or if they are using OER, better ways they can do it and really learning from some distance education experts. So with that, I will stop my spiel um, and I will turn it over to the crew from ISKME just to give us a, a quick overview. Um, of the resource. Great, thank you, Ryan. <clears throat> this is Amy, and we're thrilled to partner with Michelson 20MM. ISKME is a nonprofit based in Northern California that does education research, and uh, we're, we're really advocates for democratizing access to education in general, and certainly in the community college space. Uh, in California and across the nation. We, we look to build evidence-based professional learning tools, and this project is an example of that. There may be folks uh, on the call that don't know what OER is in open education, and it's really um, a game-changing mechanism for making teaching and learning materials free and open forever 
with a, a type of licensing that goes beyond traditional copyright. And that could be all kinds of materials, course materials, lessons, videos, and textbooks that change the, the way that people access and use their course materials. Let's go to the next slide. Now, as Ryan mentioned, COVID really changed everything. Uh, and in California, we've had previous crises with the wildfires, evacuations, uh, and COVID really exacerbated the inequities to access. And in the community college space, in particular, where colleges were, campuses were closed, libraries were closed, um, normal access to materials for students was not available. And there were many gaps we found in publishers making materials available uh, where students either were forced to purchase access codes to textbooks, the digital versions were not available, and uh, even more so students could not afford to um, purchase materials for their courses. And they were really left out in the cold in this, in this period. So what we wanted to do is understand where of colleges, uh, and today we're gonna focus on Fresno City College, are seeing uh, changes to online teaching and learning and OER as a mechanism for addressing the crisis and in the long term, how to address equity and access with materials. So with OER, there are a number of ways to take a digital, open digital textbook that's ready-made like OpenStax, to curate openly licensed material and work in Canvas as the uh, folks do across California to build new course materials or adapt OER that's out there. And then also see this adaptation and authoring environment as a way to address social justice, to make material that's culturally responsive and relevant and inclusive so that um, OER is also a mechanism for having more representational, uh, and lifting up voices that have not traditionally been part of courseware, that have traditionally been marginalized. So to this end, I'm going to now um, switch over to Cynthia to tell us about the specific project and the guide, walk us through it. And I will also put the link in the chat for folks that might want to see the, uh, the guide firsthand. Great, thank you, Amy. So the big picture of this guide, which we created in collaboration with five community college leaders, and we're really working with folks like Jody Seeley, who's on the panel today, who are leading the way in integrating OER into their online course model at their institutions. So these are the OER champions, the distance learning leads, the online learning leads, who are really have for a long time been thinking about how OER can support online learning. And in collaboration with them, we created a guide which is really directed at faculty. Um, and I'm going to just show you a quick um, take you through the guide quickly, Let's see. So the big picture of the guide is that it really seeks to address the challenges that Amy mentioned with regards to students' lack of access to textbooks as their libraries and schools are closed as a result of COVID and other crises, and then faculty's need for high quality digital resources in the online setting. So what we've tried to do this guide is, with the guide is really demonstrate for faculty how OER can be used to create, to efficiently, efficiently create quality online courses through its ability to be easily integrated or even pasted into their course management systems like Canvas. Um, we also want to use the guide as a way to demonstrate how OER can support faculty in making their expertise more prevalent as they're able to edit and refine OER that they find to match their subject area expertise rather than teaching the, to the chapters that commercial publishers dictate. And then also the guide is intended to show how OER can be used to 
create more student-centered online learning experiences, again, through the adaptable nature of OER that allows the materials to be aligned to accessibility requirements, UDL requirements, and then also curriculum reform requirements through a social justice lens. Um, so the key to the guide is that we really wanted to show how OER is quickly sort of tailored to faculty's local tools like Canvas and how there are existing supports out there like OpenStack course shells which are, in, which are available in Canvas Commons and that faculty can quickly kind of tailor to their own course needs. Um, so we have a section on really using OER from the course building perspective and the tools that faculty are using. Um, and another really helpful part of this guide is really demonstrating the ways that OER can support quality online course design. So what we did is we created a crosswalk for faculty that showed the um, California virtual campus online rubric um, for creating online materials. We crosswalked that rubric, which is prevalent in California, but it could also be crosswalked to the Quality Matters higher ed rubric for online courses. Um, but what we've tried to do is show how OER really does help meet those standards for quality online courses. Um, providing concrete examples there. And then the guide really moves into sections around the ways that OER can support universal design for learning, accessibility requirements, as well as curriculum reform, as I mentioned. The guide lists the resources and tools that faculty can use in creating online courses using OER, as well as a short primer on the what and why of OER for those who, who need a little bit of additional support. Um, in addition to this faculty guide, which is licensed as Creative Commons, and folks can take it, use it, reuse it however they like, we're creating an administrator guide, um, which is sort of part two, and that will be ready in, in just about a week or so, and we'll put that out, and it's really intended to support college and campus leaders in thinking about the ways that they can in turn support their faculty in using OER for online learning. So there's um, tips in there on thinking about how policy and, and, co and resolutions um, can help support the use of OER on their campuses, as well as more practical support for ways that they can help faculty. Great. So, Amy, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Cynthia. We really see this guide as uh, a support mechanism, uh, a way to have um, multiple entry points into OER if folks are not yet um, integrating OER. And we know that across California, there has been a long-term uh, uh, effort around OER, and yet it differs from campus to campus. So we're going to spotlight Fresno City, and I have um, go to the questions. We have a few questions for our panelists, and I'll start first with Jody. Uh, Jody, tell us about um, the key shifts that happened at Fresno City. There were uh, COVID was affecting everyone, uh, but Fresno City. Uh, where you were and where you went in light of the pandemic and the role of OER in, in these shifts. Thank you, Amy. Um, yes, uh, Fresno City College has um, a strong student-centered um, focus. And so um, prior to COVID, we had um, pockets of dedicated efforts um, to uh, improving the student experience and student success. Um, at our college. Um, we are still a part of several initiatives, um, including uh, those that um, surround distance education, 
of course, those with OER, um, equity and diversity, and then guided pathways. Um, so we have these rich pockets of, of data and focus, but what we realized in March is that those are often siloed. And um, I say that just with honesty. I imagine that that's the way it is at many other colleges, um, that we have these really um, rich um, strategies for improving student access and success and their experience, um, but we don't often see them married together. Um, in the case of OER and distance education at Fresno City, um, there was at least um, some dating that started. <laughs> um, and that's because of um, Sally Potter, who you'll hear from uh, here on this panel. Um, she and I have worked together with distance education. Um, and of course, our, our mutual interest in both of those has been a really great um, relationship and partnership. Um, but from, from my side of it, as an administrator um, with a specialty in distance education, my work with um, the CBC OEI, uh, their advisory committee, and um, other um, things that I've been active with them in over the last five years, that really has shaped my um, approach to distance learning uh, at Fresno City and focusing on the holistic uh, experience for students. Um, when well, prior to COVID, we had a tremendous growth in distance education, really 4,000% uh, or 400%, wouldn't that be something? That's probably what it is right now. 400% <laughs> growth in online course enrollment over the last three years. Um, and that was um, seeded in training faculty and encouraging certification around the CDC OEI course design rubric. Um, as far as OER, um, Sally led um, a small grant of $24,000 that we were just analyzing the impact of that grant in February. And Wes, um, who is also on this panel, can talk about those efforts. Um, but we just analyzed the results and found that that $24,000 investment um, yielded $226,000 in savings for students. Um, and so that was really encouraging. When we looked at the data for distance education, when you compare face-to-face um, -face and online instruction um, across the state, but really at Fresno City College, it's even a little more improved, is that there's no statistical difference um, in their success rates. And that's something that we're very proud of. Um, all of those decisions and, and all of the um, efforts that we had up till COVID and beyond are heavily based on data um, for our strategic um, decision making. And um, that's because we're a large college. Um, we knew that we had been progressively training um, faculty for distance education. Um, but when we looked at our data in March, um, we found some really big gaps that we knew were going to be um, problematic. And that was um, that only 230 of our faculty were certified to teach with distance education. Um, and we had hundreds more who, who had not. Um, we also found that of our students, 24,000 students, 11,000 of them had never had a distance education course, not online or hybrid. And so um, if you drilled down a little more, you would see that 9,000 of those students were students of color. So um, knowing that those were the stats that we faced, um, we went to, to work in creating batch treatment um, to help train faculty and to support students, not only in learning how to teach and learn with distance education, but also um, supporting them um, emotionally um, and with equipment <laughs> and all kinds of other things that I'm sure many of you are, are familiar with. Um, where OER fits in there, though, is these, um, these, these templates that um, Cynthia went over briefly that are open stacks. Um, they are almost too good to be true, um, but they are fully loaded with uh, an open education resource textbook. Um, they include ancillary items as well and uh, really ready to go, which alleviates the burden uh, for faculty to an extent so that they could just learn, learn to use the technology versus also having to curate all the content. Now that's not the only option. Um, both Wes and Sally have um, 
applied their, their own strategies to their departments that have been incredibly successful. Um, we're really proud of their efforts. Um, I would say that um, when, when ISKME approached me um, for this project, I really was excited because as I mentioned, those pockets, those silos of focused efforts um, really haven't blended together. And I think um, the data reveals that we need to. Uh, now is the time. Now is the time to uh, look at OER and distance education, guided pathways and di di uh, distance education, um, equity and online teaching and learning. So um, bringing those together, um, it's very encouraging to see this as a first step. I think my colleagues will speak about um, the, the investment of time that it takes to transition from face-to-face -to, -face to distance education is immense. It's really immense. Um, and I, I really feel for that burden for faculty um, and I'm really dedicated to them not wasting their time in that and becoming um, shackled to a publisher textbook um, is going to mean that they'll have to readjust after all of this work um, as we continue and, and we don't know where the end of this, um, this emergency is. So with all of that said, as we continue to move forward, um, we're encouraging faculty to adopt open educational resources so that they can choose their content rather than it being chosen for them. And um, when we uh, are supporting the CVC OEI online course design rubric, um, we're blending in uh, OER as an option, um, especially with our efforts uh, revolved around equity. Um, we realize that many of our students are even more so um, financially, um, uh, financially um, hindered. Um, they, they, many of them have lost their jobs and we know that cost is a factor when it comes to how many units you can take or if you go to college at all. Um, and as the data shows when we go forward, the number of students who are not returning to college um, or are dropping out this is very, very concerning, not just for us as an institution, but for our state as a whole. Um, so with that, I think uh, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, Jody. because you, um, let's just go to the next question, Cynthia. Um, you highlighted the holistic approach that you're taking by combining what you have learned about distance said what it takes for faculty to be up and running and the training and support that they need and the, the, the freedom and also responsibility that, that OER affords uh, when, when uh, their support, when faculty are supported to take on um, new roles and new relationships with, with, in terms of their curriculum. So yeah. uh, Sally, why don't, why don't we go to you? Um, You've been uh, seeing changes in online teaching and learning with um, English language arts um, faculty and curriculum. Um, what have been the, your highlights and the, the role of OER in, in addressing some of the, the changes and the pressures? Yeah, so um, thinking about this question, um, I think, you know, prior to um, the shift to online delivery in March of this year, there have been a lot of discussions about, you know, uh, that I've been involved in with best practices um, for online learning um, and use of OER and um, specifically the, the, the best practices for online learning have included things like, you know, how to make these online courses as rigorous and as rich um, a learning experience as a face-to-face -face classroom. And any of the, the access conversations have really focused more on um, accessibility and 508, 504 compliance they haven't really been about general access or um, UDL. Um, and um, I think with the, you know, this switch that we've had, um, it really has been, has taken these, these silos that we've been working in 
um, you know, one of the silos is equity, where we've been looking across the board and Fresno City College has seen a huge um, culture shift in the last few years um, with equity. We've you know, had a, a lot of equity practices that we've employed on our campus. And then at the same time, um, you know, um, a growth in online learning. But we haven't really, you know, as Jody you know, alluded to, we've, they've been dating, but they haven't really collided until March. And then, you know, as we look, and I, I feel that faculty were really searching and craving and looking for the places where we could um, you know, marry these two and look for, well, what are the best practices that we can employ to reach all of our students, not just the students who want and need and expect and are used to online classes, but all of our students, all students who need a college education. And so, the places where um, we know that you know, we can employ these best, best practices and looking at the best practices of online learning, you know, some things that, um, that we know reach our marginalized students you know, very well, some things like proactively reaching out to them, those are even more important in, in some of these times. Um, but other things that are really important for them, things like, um, lowering the cognitive load for students. Those things become even more important in these times. Um, and so OER can be a big part of that. So for example, um, one of the best practices for online classes is that you have um, a weekly, you know, standardized weekly module so that every week and students know what to expect. And so when they log on, um, you know, it's very standardized. They know from, you know, each week they know what to do and they have these little, um, you know, like bite-sized chunks that are delivered to them. And um, OER as, um, you know, can be designed to be um, you know, delivered to them in this way, where a traditional textbook can't really be designed to do that. You know, you have to, um, you know, explain it to them to go out or to, you know, be linked or um, to be, um, you know, um, uh, more explanation would have to be given to them. And so it would increase their cognitive load. So there are some things mm -hmm. like that. Um, another example would be that, um, and, and I know that, you know, this is one of the, um, the things that I think is very common for many instructors. When, when I first started um, teaching um, in my college classes, I think this is really common for a lot of instructors. I was given a textbook. I didn't choose my textbook. They gave it to me. And I started teaching chapter one, and I did chapter one, and then I did chapter two, and then I did chapter three, and then I gave a test, and I just followed that. Um, and then as I became more um, confident, and as I, you know, um, got into my material more, and as I became a more, um, a better instructor, I started to, um, uh, you know, design my classes better, and think, start thinking about my SLOs, and start teaching to my objectives better. And so this is really um, more an expression of my academic freedom. And, I, and so now I'm picking and choosing, but now I have this textbook that I have required students to purchase. And so now I start to feel guilty if I don't assign them all of the chapters or most of the chapters. So then what I would do is assign reading or assignments from my textbook that I didn't really need to assign them, but I, did so anyway, because I would feel guilty that I made them buy this book. And um, so releasing instructors from that is a huge thing. It um, not only allows us academic freedom, but it also releases students from this extra work that they have to do where they can meet the objectives and the outcomes for the class, but they don't have this extra cognitive load um, that they need to follow. Um, That's great, Sally. Let me um, stop you there. Let me stop you there for a second because you're really um, highlighting an important point. Um, in addition to student access, OER is really changing the nature of teaching and learning and supporting faculty to make these design decisions and pedagogical improvements. Uh, so maybe let's uh, go to you, Wes. You had told me that you were um, implementing OER and uh, zero textbook cost pathways before COVID. Uh, 
did this allow you to be uh, and your other faculty in the philosophy department to be more prepared for the switch to remote learning? Uh, what what impact did OER have on your your process and your transition? Thank you. Well, hi, everybody. So I'm kind of embarrassed to say that nothing really changed for me uh, with the pandemic because especially I'm embarrassed to say that because so many of my colleagues and maybe people who are watching um, have struggled a lot. I had uh, fully implemented OER for a few semesters before this. So uh, when it uh, came about, I was kind of prepared and up and ready to go and not a lot changed for me. I was first introduced to OER in 2006 while I was TAing for a professor in grad school. He had written a Creative Commons textbook for logic and uh, I helped him edit that, but it kind of fell off my radar. I, I was always, Kind of conscious of making sure students had affordable text. I tried to go the Oxford route because it's not for profit and I would uh, you know try to get them as used books if I could because I knew that they would be struggling with textbooks but they would still change editions constantly and I would have to change the way I was teaching and again like Sally said teach articles that I didn't think were that important but just didn't want the students not to think that they uh, were getting ripped off because they had to buy a text. Um, so that the, the, the changes wouldn't be that significant, but the students would have to buy a new textbook. They wouldn't be available. It just made me feel really guilty, uh, as Sally was saying. OER kind of reappeared on my radar when Dr. Steely graciously got some funding for me to attend this online instruction conference. And that conference had several different uh, workshops on OER textbooks and free or zero cost or free textbooks. And I was shocked by some of the data that you've shared and that uh, people typically share about how many students will choose to forego a textbook altogether because they have to prioritize things in their life. They have to choose between taking care of themselves and buying food for their family or buying a textbook that costs a couple hundred dollars. And uh, that kind of stood out to me as an ethicist, as, an, as a social justice issue, uh, an issue of equity as well, uh, because I learned at these conferences that it impacts students of color uh, more. So I spent some time at that conference with some librarians and other people who were giving the workshops and trying to figure out what was a good option for my discipline. I think every discipline has to approach it a little differently. And it looked like the best option for me as a philosopher was to create my own anthologies from articles that were in the public domain and library resources that you can use if they're electronic and behind firewalls and that kind of thing. So I uh, examined a bunch of different anthologies, some that I'd been using, some that I hadn't. I kind of created a reading list of all of the ones that kept showing up. I sent that list out to uh, all of the people in my department and asked for their input to see if, if I was missing any of the articles. Uh, I revised that list and then just uh, made an appointment with one of the librarians at our college and asked if they could set aside a few hours for me. And, uh, she graciously did. We just went through the whole list, uh, tried to find as many of the articles as we could. We found most of them either, again, in public domain or that the library held as electronic resources that I could then put behind the paywall or, or the um, firewall of our uh, Canvas site and uh, created this anthology. And that brought about a lot of benefits for me. Uh, some of which Sally and others uh, said, I could pick out more diverse reading materials. Philosophy is shamefully uh, behind uh, in that. It's, uh, you can go whole courses and only uh, learn from old white men. And so we were able to uh, make more diverse reading lists. Uh, we were able to uh, find some things that I think students could apply to more. I didn't have to assign articles I didn't like anymore. Um, and then when COVID set in, I was ready, set, and go, and uh, I was in a lot of better positions than my other colleagues who were uh, trying to scramble. Uh, it also, one other benefit is that it gives you a really quick reaction to things like COVID. Uh, I didn't, I shamefully didn't do this. My colleagues did. I have to give them full praise, but they uh, added chapters in their ethics sections to, uh, that talked about the ethics of COVID. They added sections uh, to respond to Black Lives Matter. And uh, with traditional text, it takes years to get a new text and they were able to do it rather quickly. So I, I'm a, a strong believer, firm believer in OER and I, I think it's really helpful for people. Thank you, Les. Um, let's go 
to the next slide. Um, Wes and Sally, you really highlighted things that directly impact uh, students and, um, and addressing equity and access. Uh, I'd love to hear now, um, maybe first from Giselle, about the challenges that you face in accessing materials. Um, we, we know that um, textbooks can be extremely expensive. And uh, you're, you told me a bit about um, the delay in your financial aid. Um, so why don't you tell us a little bit about what your experience was, Giselle? Yes, of course. Thank you, Amy. So uh, my biggest challenge for me um, was coming up with the money to pay for the books because they are ridiculously expensive. So I would have to apply to financial aid every semester. But for some reason, it odd, always would get delayed. So I wouldn't get my money till three weeks after the semester started. So I would miss out on any information that was um, that was in the textbook so i would have to like call my friends i would have to like say hey can you screenshot pictures and send them to me and um, i tried my best to still get good grades but i mean it, it it always made me stress a lot so that was like the biggest challenge for me and um i believe um your program that you guys come up with oer will definitely help everybody because um right now that the pandemic has hit us um they're having us buy books online but the only thing I don't like about it is that I'm not able to bring any of the stuff out just because of copyright. So if I want to highlight anything or if I want to print anything out, I can't. And I'm more of a visual learner. So that's one of the parts that I don't like about it. And you did explain to me that with your guys' program, we will be able to print out um, some of the material and we'll be able to like, if we want to download anything, we'll be able to do that too. So I believe that's very helpful. That's great, Giselle. That's an important point. It's not um, just the financial burden, but how how students are able to engage in the material and really make it your own, be able to um, annotate and print it and learn in the way that you want to is really a, a really important piece and a piece that OER hopes to better address. Uh, so thanks for that. Um, so now to Nelly, um, tell us a little bit about uh, your experience um, working online with OER, some um, courses you had uh, provided open materials and some did not. How did that, how is that going for you? Hi everyone, uh, this was actually my first, well since COVID hit, was my first time taking online classes. I've never done it before. And for some professors, you actually have to wait until the very first day of the lecture until they tell you what you need. And then that takes like another whole week to get the books. Um, but and it is true, like Giselle mentioned, we do end up getting a lot of ebooks, which are so inconvenient to actually learn things from them because they're super long and you don't even know what you're, only some of the professors have them highlighted sections, but that's it. Um, actually, even before COVID, I did have a course that uh, my calculus professor, he actually wrote his own book and uh, it wasn't it wasn't $100, it was like $20, $30, but it was super helpful because we actually did see what he wanted from us and what he expected for us to do exactly. So we didn't really end up learning way too much or um, super not related stuff. So it was really helpful. And um, as of right now, uh, I have taken a bunch of online courses and I would say that um, when I do have resources that are um, like more organized and more managed like modules and stuff, it, it was really helpful because I do, I can set up my uh, schedule the way I want to and I can do my homework whenever and make everything on time, mostly. So, thank you. That's great. I think you're also highlighting uh, the notion that OER uh, can be customized to, uh, to fit the class and that um, you're able, I think you mentioned calculus, the, that book was really tailored to what the students needed to learn. You weren't uh, rooting through a, a textbook that was so massive that you didn't know what was going to be taught or on the test. And I think that's a really key point to, to OER. So let's just jump into uh, a next set of questions for everyone. Uh, and also back to you, Jody. Um, where do you see uh, new changes coming? We know that COVID is not just for the moment. We can't make do with what we have now. It's, we're really looking at long-term change 
and not going back to uh, what we had considered normal. So what specific changes would really make a difference in advancing online learning um, across uh, at Fresno and across California community colleges? Yeah, that's a terrific question. Um, you know, <clears throat> without uh, disaster planning, uh, which most of us have not had, um, it, it often takes a disaster to even realize that a disaster plan would really come in handy. Um, and I have uh, learned that from my colleagues whose distance education programs have become really um, priceless uh, when responding to fires and floods. Um, and so those conversations about a disaster plan uh, were already happening amongst some of us in distance education. Um, I would say that uh, we need to continue um, and really uh, engage in having a plan. Um, you know, there's a lot of lessons to learn here. And I know that we've all been very reactive and there's been chaos in our um, personal lives and our professional lives. Um, as the dust settles a little bit, I think um, we'll have to have concerted efforts um, to look at um, the positives of, of what uh, we're doing and the impact that it has on students at the same time being honest with uh, what we've done that hasn't worked. Um, and that's where I think the data uh, comes, uh, comes into play. And I don't just mean um, quantitative data, I think qualitative data, especially hearing directly from students like the two we have here is uh, the most valuable. Um, and we had surveyed some of our students about just OER, not in distance ed prior to COVID in February. And um, their reasons um, are, are universal. Um, all, all students have these struggles and it's hindering their ability to be successful in college. Um, and if there's something that we can do we should do it. <clears throat> the, the fact that uh, the shift to distance ed um, has caused such chaos to uh, put everything in a, in a digital realm, um, I, I really think that uh, colleagues like, like um, Sally and Wes can help faculty uh, recover from this and give them hope that the time that they've invested in curating their materials is um, not going to be that heavy lift as we go on, um, that it can be the, the foundation uh, for, for a more rich teaching and learning environment. And we hear that from folks who are already doing it. So um, that's how I see it coming into play. Sally uh, or Wes, do you, do you wanna to add to that? Or you both mentioned talking about um, equity and and really the change in agency that OER allows faculty to have over material. Do you wanna maybe uh, there's a real, comment on that? There, there's a real interesting you know, um, thing that, that happens um, and this happens when um, you know, instructors train for um, online teaching. It also happens when um, instructors um, does, uh, look at OER um, and it's pedagogy. So most um, community college instructors don't have a whole lot of pedagogical training, right? We have a master's in a discipline and we have experience uh, taking college courses from our degrees and then we're thrown into a classroom. And that's our kind of our, our pedagogy. You know, we, we teach how we were taught. Um, so we don't have a whole lot of background in that. Um, but when we go through these, um, these, these trainings, um, we, get the, we get the background um, in, in how to teach and how to teach from um, kind of this backward design, right? You, you look at your, your objectives and then you find materials to teach to those objectives and then you design assessments and then you, um, you know, and, and you're, you're designing in, in a backwards way. Um, and that can only, you know, it not only helps instructors and, um, you know, and, and allows us to teach what we need to teach the way that we want to teach and gives us a lot of freedom, but it also really helps students and makes things clear um, and really gives them the best possible experience. So I think that those two things coming together is really only going to serve to help, you know, overall to make, um, uh, you know, community college education better in the long run. 
I think I think, I think if all, I, don't mind, yeah, go ahead. I think that um, Sally is really um, is really making an important point there um, as your experience in learning about OER, DE, Guided Pathways, Equity, um, you know, it does, it does waken up your, um, your thought process of how do you teach this material. Um, but what we've really taken a look at is shifting everything to virtual environment is um, you hear all of these catchwords, you know, we need to focus on equity, you need to teach with distance education, um, you know, make sure you incorporate your student learning outcomes. I mean, think about all of those things that um, that instructors are being asked to to weave in immediately. Um, that cognitive overload for them is extreme. And you're talking about faculty who want to do a good job. Um, and and that has uh, that has caused us um, who are creating uh, training opportunities um, great stress to try and make that. Um, to, uh, to alleviate that burden, which is what I said before. Um, but now we'll be able to connect the dots, you see. Folks who never taught with distance education but were active in equity, they will connect the dots, right? Because they'll see that that marriage is, um, is a beneficial one. Uh, same with guided pathways. Let's look at a fully online guided pathway with a zero cost uh, degree program. So that's where we're going to have these, these great minds come from these specialty areas that are really going to make our institution much better. Uh, all of you really highlighted an aspect uh, that education and OER depend on, which is collaboration. You're not doing this alone. And uh, not uh, your teaching can of, often be an isolated profession, uh, but this this notion of being able to leverage each other's work, I think does change uh, that uh, sort of formula of having to just have all the answers and do all the work oneself. Do um, you think there's, uh, with, the, with the call for more inclusive material, uh, how will this collaboration benefit um, having more culturally relevant material, perhaps? Well, I, I think for me, um, it, it helps reach the students that we actually have, you know? So uh, like I said, in philosophy especially, uh, we've had a diversity problem, you know, since the beginning. I mean, we describe philosophy as Western philosophy. We don't uh, think, and we're only trained in that. And so we, uh, our department coming into this has started reading groups together to kind of train ourselves in world philosophy. We've wanted, we've talked seriously about how we respond to things like Black Lives Matter, how we respond to closing equity gaps. We started looking at our data together. We started looking at our reading material, our job descriptions when we hire, uh, everything. And so I think it's um, like uh, Jody was saying, it's just, all of these things are interrelated and you can't start pulling at one string without finding out what it's woven into with everything else. So uh, this was just kind of the natural progression because honestly, you don't find a lot of textbooks in my discipline at least uh, that show that kind of diversity. And so being uh, freed from that kind of allows us to bring it in and, and do something that we really needed to do. That's great. Well, we have a, a few minutes where we could have questions from Anyone that's that's watching that would like to put a question in chat or ask to be unmuted, raise your hand. We're we're happy to have your comments and input and questions for the panel. Yeah, Amy, and it looks like we actually had someone who had submitted a question in the Q and A function a bit earlier. Uh, so I'll read it aloud. Um, I'm not sure who would be the best person to answer. Definitely not me, though. Uh, the question is from uh, Ryan Edwards. Uh, so the question is, have institutions submitted ex libris content suggestions to add OER resources like LibreTeX and Merlot to be added to CDI so that the content is searchable and discoverable in the OneSearch library catalog, Primo, VE, et cetera? I, 
I don't know the answer to that question. Um, and I think that if, um, if there isn't an immediate answer, I would have to guess that it hasn't happened, but it's a, it's a wonderful suggestion. Um, I know that um, Sally is, has been really good about um, making those archives accessible to uh, faculty because what, what has happened is we've had these workshops um, to where faculty get really excited and they believe in using them. But then the next step is how, you know, how do I do that? Um, and sending them to these archived areas like Merlot um, and OER Commons, um, you know, that is, those are individual searches, right? So I'm not aware, um, Amy or Cynthia, maybe you are about having um, those um, searchable, like Google searches my HBO Max and my Prime if, just to find my what a, whatever episode I want to watch. So do we have something like that? Um, I'm not sure about some of these systems. Um, if me is, uh, is the creator of OER Commons, a digital library, and there is a way for anyone to suggest uh, adding OER resources to that library and anyone is, um, you know, welcome to either um, send metadata to be, uh, to be vetted for that library, to make content within the system that can be then reviewed by others. So there's, um, as far as, you know, our, our knowledge of that system, that's where we put a, a lot of our curatorial energy and um, train faculty on how to use those tools to, to curate their own material and align them to their own learning objectives. So sorry, I couldn't answer that specific question. Um, there's another question. question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, there's another question from Maria Guzman about um, SLO updates and if those are have been useful so for supporting the use of, of OER. Um, and I, I just wanna speak to um, the distance ed side because um, every community college in the state of California has been operating under an emer emergency DE addenda. Um, and that has um, caused uh, some examination of what should be in a DE addenda. And um, for, for those, the SLOs um, are examined because um, you need to identify how are you going to meet those SLOs in the virtual environment. Um, and that is different um, than it is face-to-face, -face. different in how you meet them. The, the SLOs are the same, but how do you accomplish those in a virtual um, asynchronous environment? So that opens up the door for conversation. Um, and I would also venture to say that in a DE addenda, a permanent one, um, the uh, Academic Senate of California has recommended that an exemplary DE addenda uh, have a, a point on there about considering the use of OER. Uh, have you considered the use of OER? Uh, you know, why or why not sort of thing. So we really do need areas to open up these conversations and maybe SLOs in the DE addenda will be a place for that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Speak, well, we have uh, speak about one more. Ed, um, I think that might be a college specific, um, you know, uh, thing. And to make matters more complicated, at Fresno City, we used to be Curriculant. Now we're Illumin, but we're switching back to Curriculant. And so there might be an instance um, that's. But I think that might be a specific thing for your college. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. We have um, just a couple more minutes, uh, but let's go to um, our next slide so that uh, folks can see, again, the, the link to the guide, and we'll be sharing uh, the administrator guide and have a webinar that also highlights um, points from the administrator guide. Yeah, and, um, um, just, yeah that's going to be a really great um, companion um, because as Sally and I were um, supporting the Cool for Ed grants, um, we were also looking for um, policies, uh, BPs and ARs. Um, Sally smiling, she, she knows that it was a scavenger hunt because we couldn't find um, any more than two. 
So I hope that um, in the quick start guide, um, that encourages more conversations to develop those because this direct access that Wes and Sally are talking about with their own students, with their departments, and then uh, with the institution as a whole, those are incredibly valuable. Um, but to uh, bring in resources and additional support, uh, we need to have those BPs and ARs uh, where the, the institution um, comes out and says, we support these efforts. Um, and then um, you know, in the middle there is uh, where we need to institutionalize these efforts to a greater extent. And I would just add, if there are any um, administrators here, anybody who talks to administrators, um, I, from a faculty perspective, the best thing that administrators can do is hands off. So support, money, release time, you know, any support that you can give that way, but um, hands off. It should be a faculty decision, it should be faculty driven, should be faculty led, um, but it should not be a mandate from administration. Thanks so much for those comments. Uh, it, it, we've, we've touched on so many important points and there's so much more work to do to move this movement forward. I really wanna thank folks for joining us and hand it to you, Ryan. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, just echoing um, Amy's comments, one to our panelists for joining us today to talk about their experience, um, to ISKME who did so much work in sort of creating this guidebook. If you do have additional questions for us, um, you can feel free to reach out. Uh, these are our contact information. Um, and for those of you who have uh, subscribed to this, uh, webinar, um, we will be announcing uh, the January webinar for administrators, and you'll get that email announcement. So feel free to share it with any administrator who you think uh, would be interested. But thank you, everyone, for your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.